Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 604 Smells Like. I woke up this morning and too early and went on my walk and it smelled like not teen spirit because there are no teens here anymore, but it smelled like fall for the first time in, oh, you know, about a year, (laughs) but it was lovely. It was a lovely walk. It was cool. It was dark. Uh, The sun is rising later and later, which I like. I like me some dark in the morning. It's quiet, and I like the quiet too, which is good because inside my head, it is not quiet. Maybe that's why I need to be around quiet so much. There's a lot going on. I'm getting ready for uh, several birthdays this month, getting ready for an in-person book club to start back up again, getting ready for Ireland. So that's exciting. And uh, yeah. holy cow, it's it, time has been passing so slowly. And then all of a sudden, no, it's not passing slowly. It, it's flying by. Whew. Which reminds me, the one thing I have to share for you this week is you've heard me talk about overly sarcastic productions before. Uh, Red, who is, I think... I think of her as kind of the main propulsion force behind overly sarcastic productions. I don't know if that's true or not, but she she runs that channel with a friend of hers from school. He, he goes by the name Blue. So she's red, he's blue. Everybody has a color and you rarely see them in any format other than animated. But he's the history guy. Back five years ago, when they were really starting out, I listened to several of his histories and (laughs) Alexander the Pretty Good. Um, They were good, but they didn't wow me overly much. I mean, I, I always learned something, so that's good. He's gone back and re-released or released what is now being called resummarized chunks of history. And I listened to uh, Caesar, the Ottoman Empire, uh, Augustus. There were several that I listened to in a row. And wow, the maps are better. The details are more broad. Uh, The humor is, as always, exactly what you would expect from overly sarcastic productions. Really really solid work. So if you are, you know, curious about things, lots of things, any things, uh, you might want to check that out. I'll put a link to the ones that I listened to in the show notes, and that will at least give you a starting point. If uh, If you're sitting there and sewing and you have your computer or phone next to you, they are really nice, low stress things to have on in the background because every once in a while your ear will perk up and you go, oh, I didn't know that. Or at least that's that's what I do. I hope you do too. It's fun. So aside from all of that, I am boring. I am boring and I'm not doing much. And therefore, books. Joan of Arc, book three, chapters seven to nine. In today's three chapters, we get a lot of Mark Twain making it clear to us Mark Twain just how awesome he thinks Joan is. 
there is a, a lot of Louis de Comte, our, our narrator, waxing rhapsodic about Joan's epic awesomeness. All of which is probably true, but it it does become clear that Twain, who was definitely in his twilight years at this point, who had lost his daughters, his wife, it was it was a hard time. Um, he was putting his all into the story, and in some ways, writing about how wonderful Joan is was an analog for writing about his first daughter who had passed away. So just, don't, you know, keep don't it forget that this is like that he's not creepy, creepy old guy, guy who's got a crush on this 17, 18 year old historical figure in an inappropriate way. Uh, he's not, he's not there. He is missing the females in his life. And Louis de Comte, goes back and forth between uh, him at the time and him as the old man telling this story, which is kind of like the setup that Mark Twain had for uh, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court. Um, we are going to be spending more time in Louis de Comte's voice as an older man looking back, which makes a lot of sense because we are now hot and heavy into uh, historical validated information. Um, we don't get my favorite quote from Joan yet, but we do get to see Joan really <laughs> play these guys like cheap violins. There are several places where they almost get her and they don't. She's a smart cookie. So that's pretty much everything I wanted to say before we listen to Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc by Mark Twain, Book 3, Chapters 7 through 9, read for us by John Greenman. Here we go. Volume 2, Book 3, Chapter 7, Craft That Was in Vain The third meeting of the court was in that same spacious chamber next day, 24th of February. How did it begin? In just the same old way. When the preparations were ended, the robed sixty-two massed in their chairs, and the guards and order-keepers distributed to their stations. Cochon spoke from his throne, and commanded Joan to lay her hands upon the Gospels and swear to tell the truth concerning everything asked her. Joan's eyes kindled, and she rose, rose and stood fine and noble, and faced towards the bishop and said, "'Take care what you do, my lord, you who are my judge.' for you take a terrible responsibility on yourself, and you presume too far. It made a great stir, and Cochon burst out upon her with an awful threat, the threat of instant condemnation unless she obeyed. That made the very bones of my body turn cold, and I saw cheeks about me blanch, for it meant fire in the stake. But Joan, still standing, answered him back, proud and undismayed. Not all the clergy in Paris and Rouen could condemn me, lacking the right. This made a great tumult, and part of it was applause from the spectators. Joan resumed her seat. The bishop still insisted. Joan said, I have already made oath. It is enough. The bishop shouted, In refusing to swear, you place yourself under suspicion. Let be. I have sworn already. It is enough. The bishop continued to insist. Joan answered that she would tell what she knew, but not all that she knew. The bishop plagued her straight along, till at last she said in a weary tone, "'I came from God. I have nothing more to do here. Return me to God, from whom I came.' It was piteous to hear. It was the same as saying, "'You only want my life. Take it, and let me be at peace.' The bishop stormed out again. Once more I command you to— Joan cut in with a nonchalant, Passez outre, and Cochon retired from the struggle. But he retired with some credit this time, for he offered a compromise, and Joan, always clear-headed, saw protection for herself in it, and promptly and willingly accepted it. She was to swear to tell the truth, as touching the matters set down in the procès verbal. They could not sail her outside of definite limits now— 
her course was over a charted sea henceforth. The bishop had granted more than he had intended, and more than he would honestly try to abide by. By command, Beaupere resumed his examination of the accused. It being lent, there might be a chance to catch her neglecting some detail of her religious duties. I could have told him he would fail there. Why, religion was her life. Since when have you eaten or drunk? If the least thing had passed her lips in the nature of sustenance, neither her youth nor the fact that she was being half-starved in her prison could save her from dangerous suspicion of contempt for the commandments of the church. I have done neither since yesterday at noon. The priest shifted to the voices again. When have you heard your voice? Yesterday and today. At what time? Yesterday it was in the morning. What were you doing then? I was asleep, and it woke me. By touching your arm? No, without touching me. Did you thank it? Did you kneel? He had Satan in his mind, you see, and was hoping, perhaps, that by and by it could be shown that she had rendered homage to the arch enemy of God and man. Yes, I thanked it, and knelt in my bed where I was chained, and joined my hands, and begged it to implore God's help for me, so that I might have light and instruction as touching the answers I should give here. Then what did the voice say? It told me to answer boldly, and God would help me. Then she turned toward Cochon and said, You say that you are my judge. Now I tell you again, take care what you do, for in truth I am sent of God, and you are putting yourself in great danger. Beaupere asked her if the voice's counsels were not fickle and variable. No, it never contradicts itself. This very day it has told me again to answer boldly. Has it forbidden you to answer only part of what is asked you? I will tell you nothing as to that. I have revelations touching the king, my master, and those I will not tell you. Then she was stirred by a great emotion, and the tears sprang to her eyes, and she spoke out as with strong conviction, saying, I believe wholly, as wholly as I believe the Christian faith, and that God has redeemed us from the fires of hell, that God speaks to me by that voice. Being questioned further concerning the voice, she said she was not at liberty to tell all she knew. Do you think God would be displeased at your telling the whole truth? The voice has commanded me to tell the king certain things, and not you, and some very lately, even last night, things which I would he knew. He would be more easy at his dinner. Why doesn't the voice speak to the king itself, as it did when you were with him? Would it not if you asked it? I do not know if it be the wish of God. She was pensive a moment or two, and busy with her thoughts, and far away, no doubt. Then she added a remark in which Beaupere, always watchful, always alert, detected a possible opening, a chance to set a trap. Do you think he jumped at it instantly, betraying the joy he had in his mind, as a young hand at craft and artifice would do? No, oh, no. You could not tell that he had noticed the remark at all. He slid indifferently away from it at once, and began to ask idle questions about other things, so as to slip around and spring on it from behind, so to speak, tedious and empty questions as to whether the voice had told her she would escape from this prison, and if it had furnished answers to be used by her in today's seance, if it was accompanied with a glory of light, if it had eyes, etc. That risky remark of Jones was this. Without the grace of God I could do nothing. The court saw the priest's game, and watched his play with a cruel eagerness. Poor Joan was grown dreamy and absent. Possibly she was tired. Her life was in imminent danger, and she did not suspect it. The time was ripe now, and Beaupere quietly and stealthily sprang his trap. "'Are you in a state of grace?' Ah, we had two or three honorable, brave men in that pack of judges, and Jean Lefebvre was one of them. He sprang to his feet and cried out, It is a terrible question. The accused is not obliged to answer it. Cochon's face flushed black with anger to see this plank flung to the perishing child, and he shouted, Silence, and take your seat. The accused will answer the question. There was no hope, 
no way out of the dilemma, for whether she said yes or whether she said no, it would be all the same, a disastrous answer, for the scriptures had said one cannot know this thing. Think what hard hearts they were to set this fatal snare for that ignorant young girl, and be proud of such work and happy in it. It was a miserable moment for me while we waited. It seemed a year. All the house showed excitement, and mainly it was glad excitement. Joan looked out upon these hungering faces with innocent, untroubled eyes, and then humbly and gently she brought out that immortal answer which brushed the formidable snare away as it had been a cobweb. "'If I be not in a state of grace, I pray God place me in it. If I be in it, I pray God keep me so.' "'Ah, you will never see an effect like that. No, not while you live.' for a space there was the silence of the grave men looked wondering into each other's faces some were awed and crossed themselves and i heard lefevre mutter it was beyond the wisdom of man to devise that answer whence comes this child's amazing inspirations beaupere presently took up his work again but the humiliation of his defeat weighed upon him and he made but a rambling and dreary business of it he not being able to put any heart in it he asked Joan a thousand questions about her childhood, and about the oak wood, and the fairies, and the children's games and romps under our dear arbre fay de Bourlemont, and this stirring up of old memories broke her voice and made her cry a little, but she bore up as well as she could, and answered everything. Then the priest finished by touching again upon the matter of her apparel, a matter which was never to be lost sight of in this still hunt for this innocent creature's life, but kept always hanging over her, a menace charged with mournful possibilities. "'Would you like a woman's dress?' "'Indeed, yes, if I may go out of this prison. But here, no.'" End of Chapter 7 Volume 2 Book 3 Chapter 8 Joan Tells of Her Visions the court met next on Monday the 27th. Would you believe it? The bishop ignored the contract limiting the examination to matters set down in the procès verbal, and again commanded Joan to take the oath without reservations. She said, You should be content, I have sworn enough. She stood her ground, and Cochon had to yield. The examination was resumed concerning Joan's voices. You have said that you recognized them as being the voices of angels the third time that you heard them. What angels were they? St. Catherine and St. Marguerite. How did you know that it was those two saints? How could you tell the one from the other? Well, I know it was they, and I know how to distinguish them. By what sign? By their manner of saluting me. I have been these seven years under their direction, and I knew who they were, because they told me. Whose was the first voice that came to you when you were thirteen years old? It was the voice of St. Michael. I saw him before my eyes, and he was not alone, but attended by a cloud of angels. Did you see the archangel and the attendant angels in the body, or in the spirit? I saw them with the eyes of my body, just as I see you, and when they went away I cried because they did not take me with them. It made me see that awful shadow again that fell dazzling white upon her that day under l'arbre fait de Bourlemont, and it made me shiver again, though it was so long ago. It was really not very long gone by, but it seemed so, because so much had happened since. In what shape and form did St. Michael appear? As to that, I have not received permission to speak. What did the archangel say to you that first time? I cannot answer you today. Meaning, I think, that she would have to get permission of her voices first. Presently, after some more questions as to the revelations which had been conveyed through her to the king, she complained of the unnecessity of all this, and said, I will say again, as I have said before many times in these sittings, that I answered all questions of this sort before the court at Poitiers, and I would that you would bring here the record of that court, and read from that. Prithee, send for that book. There was no answer. 
It was a subject that had to be got around and put aside. That book had wisely been gotten out of the way, for it contained things which would be very awkward here. Among them was a decision that Joan's mission was from God, whereas it was the intention of this inferior court to show that it was from the devil. Also a decision permitting Joan to wear male attire, whereas it was the purpose of this court to make the male attire do hurtful work against her. "'How was it that you were moved to come into France, by your own desire?' "'Yes, and by command of God. But that it was His will, I would not have come. I would sooner have had my body torn in sunder by horses than come lacking that.' Beaupere shifted once more to the matter of the male attire now, and proceeded to make a solemn talk about it. That tried Joan's patience, and presently she interrupted and said, "'It is a trifling thing, and of no consequence, and I did not put it on by counsel of any man, but by command of God.' "'Robert de Baudricourt did not order you to wear it?' "'No.' "'Did you think you did well in taking the dress of a man?' I did well to do whatsoever thing God commanded me to do. But in this particular case, do you think you did well in taking the dress of a man? I have done nothing but by command of God. Beaupere made various attempts to lead her into contradictions of herself, also to put her words and acts in disaccord with the scriptures. But it was lost time. He did not succeed. He returned to her visions, the light which shone about them, her relations with the king, and so on. "'Was there an angel above the king's head the first time you saw him?' "'By the blessed Mary!' she forced her impatience down, and finished her sentence with tranquillity. "'If there was one, I did not see it.' "'Was there light?' "'There were more than three thousand soldiers there, and five hundred torches, without taking account of spiritual light. "'What made the king believe in the revelations which you brought him?' He had signs, also the counsel of the clergy. What revelations were made to the king? You will not get that out of me this year. Presently she added, During three weeks I was questioned by the clergy at Chinon and Poitiers. The king had a sign before he would believe, and the clergy were of opinion that my acts were good and not evil. The subject was dropped now for a while and Beaupere took up the matter of the miraculous sword of Fierbois, to see if he could not find a chance there to fix the crime of sorcery upon Joan. "'How did you know that there was an ancient sword buried in the ground under the rear of the altar of the church of St. Catherine of Fierbois?' Joan had no concealments to make as to this. "'I knew the sword was there, because my voices told me so, and I sent to ask that it be given to me to carry in the wars. It seemed to me that it was not very deep in the ground. The clergy of the church caused it to be sought for and dug up, and they polished it, and the rust fell easily off from it. Were you wearing it when you were taken in battle at Compagne? No, but I wore it constantly until I left Saint-Denis after the attack upon Paris. This sword, so mysteriously discovered and so long and so constantly victorious, was suspected of being under the protection of enchantment. Was that sword blessed? What blessing had been invoked upon it? None. I loved it because it was found in the church of St. Catherine, for I loved that church very dearly. She loved it because it had been built in honor of one of her angels. Didn't you lay it upon the altar to the end that it might be lucky? the altar of Saint-Denis. No. Didn't you pray that it might be made lucky? Truly it were no harm to wish that my harness might be fortunate. Then it was not that sword which you wore in the field of Compagne. What sword did you wear there? The sword of the Burgundian, Franquet d'Arras, whom I took prisoner in the engagements at Longny. I kept it because it was a good war-sword, good to lay on stout thumps and blows with. She said that quite simply, and the contrast between her delicate little self and the grim soldier words which she dropped with such easy familiarity from her lips made many spectators smile. "'What has become of the other sword? Where is it now?' "'Is that in the procès verbal?' Beaupère did not answer. "'Which do you love best, your banner or your sword?' 
Her eye lighted gladly at the mention of her banner, and she cried out, "'I love my banner best, oh, forty times more than the sword. Sometimes I carried it myself when I charged the enemy, to avoid killing any one.' Then she added, naively, and with again that curious contrast between her girlish little personality and her subject, "'I have never killed any one.' It made a great many smile, and no wonder, when you consider what a gentle and innocent little thing she looked. One could hardly believe she had ever even seen men slaughtered. She looked so little fitted for such things. "'In the final assault at Orléans, did you tell your soldiers that the arrows shot by the enemy, and the stones discharged from their catapults, would not strike any one but you?' "'No, and the proof is that more than a hundred of my men were struck. I told them that to have no doubts and no fears, that they would raise the siege. I was wounded in the neck by an arrow in the assault upon the Bastille that commanded the bridge.' but St. Catherine comforted me, and I was cured in fifteen days, without having to quit the saddle and leave my work. Did you know that you were going to be wounded? Yes, and I had told it to the king beforehand. I had it from my voices. When you took Jargot, why did you not put its commandant to ransom? I offered him leave to go out unhurt from the place, with all his garrison, and if he would not, I would take it by storm." and you did i believe yes had your voices counseled you to take it by storm as to that i do not remember thus closed a weary long sitting without result every device that could be contrived to trap joan into wrong thinking wrong doing or disloyalty to the church or sinfulness as a little child at home or later had been tried and none of them had succeeded she had come unscathed through the ordeal was the court discouraged? No. Naturally it was very much surprised, very much astonished, to find its work baffling and difficult instead of simple and easy, but it had powerful allies in the shape of hunger, cold, fatigue, persecution, deception, and treachery, and opposed to this array nothing but a defenseless and ignorant girl, who must some time or other surrender to bodily and mental exhaustion, or get caught in one of the thousand traps set for her. And had the court made no progress during these seemingly resultless sittings? Yes, it had been feeling its way, groping here, groping there, and had found one or two vague trails which might freshen by and by and lead to something. The male attire, for instance, and the visions and voices— of course no one doubted that she had seen supernatural beings and been spoken to and advised by them, and of course no one doubted that by supernatural help miracles had been done by Joan, such as choosing out the king in a crowd when she had never seen him before, and her discovery of the sword buried under the altar. It would have been foolish to doubt these things, for we all know that the air is full of devils and angels that are visible to traffickers in magic on the one hand, and to the stainlessly holy on the other. But what many, and perhaps most, did doubt was that Joan's visions, voices, and miracles came from God. It was hoped that in time they could be proven to have been of satanic origin. Therefore, as you see, the court's persistent fashion of coming back to that subject every little while and spooking around it and prying into it was not to pass the time. It had a strictly business end in view. End of chapter 8 Volume 2, Book 3, Chapter 9, Her Sure Deliverance Foretold The next sitting opened on Thursday, the 1st of March, fifty-eight judges present, the others resting. As usual, Joan was required to take an oath without reservations. She showed no temper this time. She considered herself well buttressed by the procès-verbal compromise which Cochon was so anxious to repudiate and creep out of so she merely refused, distinctly and decidedly, and added in a spirit of fairness and candor, "'But as to matters set down in the procès-verbal, I will freely tell the whole truth, yes, as freely and fully, as if I were before the Pope.' Here was a chance. We had two or three Popes then. Only one of them could be the true Pope, of course. 
everybody judiciously shirked the question of which was the true pope and refrained from naming him it being clearly dangerous to go into particulars in this matter here was an opportunity to trick an unadvised girl into bringing herself into peril and the unfair judge lost no time in taking advantage of it he asked in a plausibly indolent and absent way which one do you consider to be the true pope the house took an attitude of deep attention and so waited to hear the answer and see the prey walk into the trap but when the answer came it covered the judge with confusion and you could see many people covertly chuckling for joan asked in a voice and manner which almost deceived even me so innocent it seemed are there two one of the ablest priests in that body and one of the best swearers there spoke right out so that half the house heard him and said by god it was a master stroke as soon as the judge was better of his embarrassment he came back to the charge and was prudent and passed by joan's question is it true that you received a letter from the count of armagnac asking you which of the three popes he ought to obey yes and answered it copies of both letters were produced and read joan said that hers had not been quite strictly copied she said she had received the count's letter when she was just mounting her horse and added so in dictating a word or two of reply i said i would try to answer him from paris or somewhere where i could be at rest she was asked again which pope she had considered the right one i was not able to instruct the count of armagnac as to which one he ought to obey then she added with a frank fearlessness which sounded fresh and wholesome in that den of trimmers and shufflers but as for me i hold that we are bound to obey our lord the pope who is at rome the matter was dropped they produced and read a copy of joan's first effort at dictating her proclamation summoning the english to retire from the siege of orleans and vacate france truly a great and fine production for an unpractised girl of seventeen do you acknowledge as your own the document which has just been read yes except that there are errors in it words which make me give myself too much importance i saw what was coming i was troubled and ashamed for instance i did not say deliver up to the maid rendez au la pucelle i said deliver up to the king rendez au roi and i did not call myself commander-in-chief chef de guerre all those are words which my secretary substituted or mayhap he misheard me or forgot what i said she did not look at me when she said it she spared me that embarrassment i hadn't misheard her at all and hadn't forgotten i changed her language purposely for she was commander-in-chief and entitled to call herself so and it was becoming and proper too and who was going to surrender anything to the king at that time a stick a, a cipher if any surrendering was done it would be to the noble maid of vaucouleurs already famed and formidable though she had not yet struck a blow ah there would have been a fine and disagreeable episode for me there if that pitiless court had discovered that the very scribbler of that piece of dictation secretary to joan of arc was present and not only present but helping build the record and not only that but destined at a far distant day to testify against lies and perversions smuggled into it by cochon and deliver them over to eternal infamy do you acknowledge that you dictated this proclamation i do have you repented of it do you retract it ah then she was indignant no not even these chains and she shook them not even these chains can chill the hopes that i uttered there and more she rose and stood a moment with a divine strange light kindling in her face then her words burst forth as in a flood i warn you now that before seven years a disaster will smite the english oh many-fold greater than the fall of orleans and silence sit down and then soon after they will lose all france now consider these things the french armies no longer existed the french cause was standing still our king was standing still there was no hint that by and by the constable richemont would come forward and take up the great work of joan of arc and finish it 
In face of all this, Joan made that prophecy, made it with perfect confidence, and it came true. For within five years Paris fell, 1436, and our king marched into it flying the victor's flag. So the first part of the prophecy was then fulfilled. In fact, almost the entire prophecy. For, with Paris in our hands, the fulfillment of the rest of it was assured. Twenty years later all France was ours excepting a single town, Calais. Now, that will remind you of an earlier prophecy of Joan's. At the time that she wanted to take Paris and could have done it with ease if our king had but consented, she said that that was the golden time, that with Paris ours all France would be ours in six months. But if this golden opportunity to recover France was wasted, said she, I give you twenty years to do it in. She was right. After Paris fell in 1436, the rest of the work had to be done city by city, castle by castle, and it took twenty years to finish it. Yes, it was the first day of March, 1431, there in the court, that she stood in the view of everybody and uttered that strange and incredible prediction. Now and then in this world somebody's prophecy turns up correct, but when you come to look into it, there is sure to be considerable room for suspicion that the prophecy was made after the fact. But here the matter is different. There in that court Joan's prophecy was set down in the official record at the hour and moment of its utterance, years before the fulfillment, and there you may read it to this day. Twenty-five years after Joan's death, the record was produced in the great court of the rehabilitation, and verified under oath by Monchon and me, and surviving judges of our court confirmed the exactness of the record in their testimony. Joan's startling utterance on that now so celebrated first of March stirred up a great turmoil, and it was some time before it quieted down again. Naturally, everybody was troubled, for a prophecy is a grisly and awful thing, whether one thinks it ascends from hell or comes down from heaven. All that these people felt sure of was that the inspiration back of it was genuine and puissant. They would have given their right hands to know the source of it. At last the questions began again. "'How do you know that those things are going to happen?' "'I know it by revelation, and I know it as surely as I know that you sit here before me.' This sort of answer was not going to allay the spreading uneasiness. Therefore, after some further dallying, the judge got the subject out of the way and took up one which he could enjoy more. "'What?' languages do your voices speak french st marguerite too verily why not she is on our side not on the english saints and angels who did not condescend to speak english is a grave affront they could not be brought into court and punished for contempt but the tribunal could take silent note of joan's remark and remember it against her which they did it might be useful by and by do your saints and angels wear jewelry, uh, crowns, rings, earrings? To Joan, questions like these were profane frivolities, and not worthy of serious notice. She answered indifferently. But the question brought to her mind another matter, and she turned upon Cochon and said, I had two rings. They have been taken away from me during my captivity. You have one of them. It is the gift of my brother." Give it back to me. If not to me, then I pray that it be given to the church. The judges conceived the idea that maybe these rings were for the working of enchantments. Perhaps they could be made to do Joan a damage. Where is the other ring? The Burgundians have it. Where did you get it? My father and mother gave it to me. Describe it. It is plain and simple and has Jesus and Mary engraved upon it. Everybody could see that that was not a valuable equipment to do devil's work with, so that trail was not worth following. Still, to make sure, one of the judges asked Joan if she had ever cured sick people by touching them with the ring. She said no. Now, as concerning the fairies, that were used to abide near by Domremy, whereof there are many reports and traditions, it is said that your godmother surprised these creatures on a summer's night dancing under the tree called l'arbre fait de bourlemont 
Is it not possible that your pretended saints and angels are but those fairies? Is that in your procès? She made no other answer. Have you not conversed with St. Marguerite and St. Catherine under that tree? I do not know. Or by the fountain near the tree? Yes, sometimes. What promises did they make you? None but such as they had God's warrant for. But what promises did they make? That is not in your procès. Yet I will say this much. They told me that the king would become master of his kingdom in spite of his enemies. And what else? There was a pause. Then she said humbly, They promised to lead me to paradise. If faces do really betray what is passing in men's minds, a fear came upon many in that house at this time that maybe, after all, a chosen servant and herald of God was here being hunted to her death. The interest deepened. Movements and whisperings ceased. The stillness became almost painful. Have you noticed that almost from the beginning the nature of the questions asked Joan showed that in some way or other the questioner very often already knew his fact before he asked his question? Have you noticed that somehow or other the questioners usually knew just how and where to search for Joan's secrets, that they really knew the bulk of her privacies, a fact not suspected by her, and that they had no task before them but to trick her into exposing those secrets? Do you remember Loisseleur, the hypocrite, the treacherous priest, Toul of Cochon? Do you remember that under the sacred seal of the confessional, Joan freely and trustingly revealed to him everything concerning her history save only a few things regarding her supernatural revelations, which her voices had forbidden her to tell to any one, and that the unjust judge, Cochon, was a hidden listener all the time? Now you understand how the inquisitors were able to devise that long array of minutely prying questions, questions whose subtlety and ingenuity and penetration are astonishing until we come to remember Loisseleur's performance and recognize their source. Ah, Bishop of Beauvais, you are now lamenting this cruel iniquity these many years in hell. Yes, verily, unless one has come to your help. There is but one among the redeemed that would do it, and it is futile to hope that that one has not already done it. Joan of Arc. We will return to the questionings. Did they make you still another promise? Yes, but that is not in your procès. I will not tell it now, but before three months I will tell it you. The judge seems to know the matter he is asking about already. One gets this idea from his next question. Did your voices tell you that you would be liberated before three months? Joan often showed a little flash of surprise at the good guessing of the judges, and she showed one this time. I was frequently in terror to find my mind, which I could not control, criticizing the voices and saying, They counsel her to speak boldly, a thing which she would do without any suggestion from them or anybody else. But when it comes to telling her any useful thing, such as how these conspirators managed to guess their way so skillfully into her affairs, they are always off attending to some other business. I am reverent by nature, and when such thoughts swept through my head they made me cold with fear, and if there was a storm and thunder at the time, I was so ill that I could but with difficulty abide at my post and do my work. Joan answered, That is not in your procès. I do not know when I shall be set free, but some who wish me out of this world will go from it before me. It made some of them shiver. Have your voices told you that you will be delivered from this prison? Without a doubt they had, and the judge knew it before he asked the question. Ask me again in three months, and I will tell you, she said it with such a happy look, the tired prisoner, and I, and Noel Regesson, drooping yonder. Why, the floods of joy went streaming through us, from crown to sole. It was all that we could do to hold still and keep from making fatal exposure of our feelings. She was to be set free in three months. That was what she meant. We saw it. The voices had told her so, and told her true, true to the very day, May 30th. But we know now that they had mercifully hidden from her how she was to be set free, but left her in ignorance. Home again. 
That was our understanding of it, Knowles and mine. That was our dream. And now we would count the days, the hours, the minutes. They would fly lightly along. They would soon be over. Yes, we would carry our idol home, and there, far from the pomps and tumults of the world, we would take up our happy life again and live it out as we had begun it, in the free air and the sunshine, with the friendly sheep and the friendly people for comrades, and the grace and charm of the meadows, the woods, and the river always before our eyes, and their deep peace in our hearts. Yes, that was our dream, the dream that carried us bravely through that three months to an exact and awful fulfillment, the thought of which would have killed us, I think, if we had foreknown it, and been obliged to bear the burden of it upon our hearts the half of those weary days. Our reading of the prophecy was this. We believed the king's soul was going to be smitten with remorse, and that he would privately plan a rescue with Joan's old lieutenants, D'Alencon and the Bastard and La Hire, and that this rescue would take place at the end of the three months. So we made up our minds to be ready and take a hand in it. In the present, and also in later sittings, Joan was urged to name the exact day of her deliverance, but she could not do that. She had not the permission of her voices. Moreover, the voices themselves did not name the precise day. Ever since the fulfillment of the prophecy, I have believed that Joan had the idea that her deliverance was going to be done in the form of death. But not that death. Divine as she was, dauntless as she was in battle, she was human also. She was not solely a saint, an angel. She was a clay-made girl also, as human a girl as any in the world, and full of a human girl's sensitiveness and tenderness and delicacies. And so that death. No, she could not have lived the three months with that one before her, I think. You remember that the first time she was wounded she was frightened and cried, just as any other girl of seventeen would have done, although she had known for eighteen days that she was going to be wounded on that very day. No, she was not afraid of any ordinary death, and an ordinary death was what she believed the prophecy of deliverance meant, I think, for her face showed happiness, not horror, when she uttered it. Now I will explain why I think as I do. Five weeks before she was captured in the Battle of Compiègne, her voices told her what was coming. They did not tell her the day or the place, but said she would be taken prisoner, and that it would be before the Feast of St. John. She begged that death, certain and swift, should be her fate, and the captivity brief, for she was a free spirit and dreaded the confinement. The voices made no promise, but only told her to bear whatever came. Now, as they did not refuse the swift death, a hopeful young thing like Joan would naturally cherish that fact and make the most of it, allowing it to grow and establish itself in her mind. And so now that she was told she was to be delivered in three months, I think she believed it meant that she would die in her bed in the prison, and that that was why she looked happy and content, the gates of paradise standing open for her, the time so short, you see, her troubles so soon to be over, her reward so close at hand. Yes, that would make her look happy. That would make her patient and bold, and able to fight her fight out like a soldier. Save herself if she could, of course, and try for the best, for that was the way she was made. But die with her face to the front, if die she must. Then later, when she charged Cochon with trying to kill her with a poisoned fish, her notion that she was to be delivered by death in the prison, if she had it, and I believe she had, would naturally be greatly strengthened, you see. But I am wandering from the trial. Joan was asked to definitely name the time that she would be delivered from prison. I have always said that I was not permitted to tell you everything. I am to be set free, and I desire to ask leave of my voices to tell you the day. That is why I wish for delay." Do your voices forbid you to tell the truth? Is it that you wish to know matters concerning the king of France? I tell you again that he will regain his kingdom, and that I know it as well as I know that you sit here before me in this tribunal. She sighed, and after a little pause added, I should be dead but for this revelation, which comforts me always. Some trivial questions were asked her about St. Michael's dress and appearance. She answered them with dignity, but one saw that they gave her pain. After a little she said, 
I have great joy in seeing him, for when I see him I have the feeling that I am not in mortal sin. She added, Sometimes St. Marguerite and St. Catherine have allowed me to confess myself to them. Here was a possible chance to set a successful snare for her innocence. When you confessed, were you in mortal sin, do you think? But her reply did her no hurt. So the inquiry was shifted once more to the revelations made to the king, secrets which the court had tried again and again to force out of Joan, but without success. Now as to the sign given to the king, I have already told you that I will tell you nothing about it. Do you know what the sign was? As to that, you will not find out from me. All this refers to Joan's secret interview with the king, held apart, though two or three others were present. It was known, through Loiseleur, of course, that this sign was a crown, and was a pledge of the verity of Joan's mission. But that is all a mystery until this day, the nature of the crown, I mean, and will remain a mystery to the end of time. We can never know whether a real crown descended upon the king's head, or only a symbol, the mystic fabric of a vision. Did you see a crown upon the king's head when he received the revelation? I cannot tell you as to that without perjury. Did the king have that crown at Rheims? I think the king put upon his head a crown which he found there, but a much richer one was brought him afterward. Have you seen that one? I cannot tell you without perjury, but whether I have seen it or not, I have heard say that it was rich and magnificent. They went on and pestered her to weariness about that mysterious crown, but they got nothing more out of her. The sitting closed. A long, hard day for all of us. End of chapter 9 So we have a pretty good idea now, uh, thanks to Twain, about how they are going about trying to catch Joan. There's the clothes that they have brought up several times. Uh, there's the prophecy, trying to maybe prove that it's not divinely inspired. I thought it was interesting that Twain calls it a grisly and awful thing. I sat with that for a while, and then I realized, oh yeah, actually knowing what the future is going to be and, and what it's going to do to you is actually really a buzzkill. It doesn't necessarily do good things for you. And I thought that was interesting that he, he said that. He was certainly alive during a time when there were a lot of uh, apocalyptic predictions. The world is going to end on specific date. And it hasn't. Yet. So. The, the jewelry was interesting. Trying to figure out if maybe she had been using a piece of jewelry to communicate with the devil. Uh, you heard the callback, which we talked about way back at the beginning of the book, that uh, her godmother dancing under the tree was going to come back to haunt her. And here it is today. One of the things that keeps coming up, especially in the chapters today, is this uh, pro se verbal. This is the, the bill of particulars, the specific items upon which the prosecution is able to base its, its argument. The, it's very similar to uh, disclosure and uh, the whole pre-trial process of getting depositions and all of that. If it's not in the pro se, then it can't be brought up. Now, Joan can't read, and she's already been lied to. She should have had counsel. She should have had a, a lawyer on her side. That was her, her right as a citizen. Couchon denied her that. Uh, I also thought it was interesting that Twain was saying that there's only one person who could pardon these people uh, it when they're in hell after they've died and uh and seemed rather sad that actually the one person who could do that would be Joan and Joan probably would because she's Joan but but I love that Joan is on top of things enough to be able to say is that in your pro se 
<laughs> I'm sorry. Why are you asking me that? I don't think you're allowed to ask me that. And boy, that had to really tick them off. I love it. And then, of course, at last, there is the prophecy, which uh, chapter nine ends on kind of an anticlimax. But a lot of that is because Twain is sticking to the the actual record. So it's not a, a particularly thrillingly created or compressed chapter. It's It's just what happened. And the, the prophecies, the section, Twain, the section Twain on when they, they tried to last get her on, of, are you in a state of grace? You're not allowed. How, when these things were written down, who had access not, to them? You are. You just all of that information. Like um, uh, plus the, the look forward to the trial of uh, reconciliation. Jones, ask me in three months is so heartbreaking because to her it's an inside joke i'll be dead and to them it's it's just another weird sign weird thing that this girl has said but uh but yeah i that was a gut punch when i heard it in court like that i'm going to go see if i can find the procès verbal uh, it's it is out there. I think it was one of the things that was really hard to get, but I will go check, and if I can, I will have it linked in the show notes for you, along with Blue's uh, history videos. And with that, I leave you. I hope you have a great day and a great week. Be well. Take care of each other. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what you hear on Craftlit, please review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, join in the fun in our Facebook group, which is Craftlit Annotated Audiobooks. Always the nicest group of people you're going to find on Facebook and the place where you can come to and say, nobody else was going to understand this, but I knew you all would. And of course, thank you for your support of Craftlit. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.